it's a little distracting, but uh, let me. Fine. Good. Well, a very warm welcome to everybody, and thanks for forsaking the sunshine on this very lovely British London evening. I'm very delighted that we have as our speaker somebody who is not London based, but one of the wonders of Zoom, of course, this way of communicating based in the States, as you will hear undoubtedly as soon as she opens her mouth. Um, Nancy <laughs> Greenspan got in touch with me, actually not that long ago, was it Nancy, but in, in oh. June to alert me to the fact um, that she had just published a book on Klaus Fuchs. And I didn't really, it's interesting, I'll be quite frank, um, Nancy, you know, at first I thought, does this fit? under the kind of aegis, if you like, under the umbrella of the Insiders Outsiders Festival, because many of you will know that I conceived of the Insiders Outsiders Festival essentially as an arts festival. So for a start here, we're talking quite emphatically about a scientist rather than an artist. Um, and also, um, well, refugee from Nazism, yes, certainly that fits. Um, as I'm sure all of you will know for very obvious historical reasons, the vast majority of those who found sanctuary, not only in this country, of course, but also in America in the 1930s were Jewish or of Jewish descent in one form or another. And Klaus Fuchs wasn't, although I think perhaps many people might have assumed or might assume even now that he was. And that whole relationship, Nancy, between being Jewish and being a communist is something that we might explore if, if time allows. Mm -hmm. um, and the other aspect, which I think further complicates the, the, the situation is that, of course, well, not of course, but the um, primary aim of the Insiders Outsiders Festival has been to celebrate, not in an uncritical, but in a kind of nuanced sort of way, in a sort of analytical sort of way, the contribution to British culture. Now, do you see what I'm getting at? That Fuchs clearly doesn't quite fit there. Uh, the nature of what he did remains deeply problematic and i think nancy above all is deeply aware of that but having said all that when she suggested that we might collaborate in some way she did at first suggest that she talked primarily about his experience of canadian internment in canada which of course is a fascinating and under known understudied topic and i believe nancy will be talking about that in some measure very shortly but i thought no actually let's let's go the whole way as it were and look the whole complex phenomenon that was Klaus Fuchs in the face. So with all those kind of caveats, I'm delighted to have Nancy with us and it promises to be a very, very fascinating, I think thought provoking um, event. Let me just um, say a few words by way of practicalities. It gets very boring at this point, but I would ask you all to remain muted and because of the numbers involved to type in your questions into the chat function and I will then channel them as it were, I will field them to Nancy as appropriate at, at the end. Um, and also, again, you probably all know this by heart by now, but I'd strongly suggest you click on the speaker view option on the top right of your screen to enable you to concentrate on Nancy and not to be distracted by everybody else listening in. More importantly, or as importantly, I'd like now to say a few words about Nancy uh, Thorndike. Greenspan. She started off her career as a health economist, but soon began writing a writing career as the co-author of four books with her husband, the late child psychiatrist Stanley Greenspan. She's author of two biographies, the first one published in uh, 2005, uh, The End of the Certain World, The Life and Science of Max Born, who of course fits the kind of wider remit of insiders outsiders in that he was very much a refugee from nazism and a very important scientist as many of you will be aware his son likewise um gustav um and most recently just a few uh, a few months ago atomic spy i mean i didn't know nancy whether you were planning to hold up the book forgive me <laughs> that's a good idea i wasn't <laughs> thank you I do without it here, here it is a nice fat uh, um hardback um yes with a wonderful title atomic spy the dark lives in the plural of klaus fuchs published by viking in may 2020. Uh, she served on the boards of numerous environmental um, organizations and is now a board member of the american institute of physics foundation and most unusually she is apparently a very accomplished ice skater <laughs> and she lives in bethesda maryland thank you so over to you nancy um let me am i this. do i need to be a co-host uh, no no you're absolutely we're all set so i can just go into share screen you should be able to do that bring up my powerpoint yep um let me yes there we go Perfect. Okay. Perfect. There we go. Well, it's very nice to be here, and I thank Monica for inviting me. Um, it is. I, I spend a lot of time in London. I visit 
several times a year and have been doing so for about 25 years. I have lots of friends, especially in the Bourne family, all their cousins and aunts and uncles and relatives. Um, and I'm going to miss it if I don't get to come back. So hopefully we will do better with our numbers here and the you, you British will allow us back in. I can understand completely why you don't um, are not doing so or anybody else not doing so, it's terrible. But anyway, it is a place I love and I have spent loads of time with you all. So let me just begin and tell you a little bit about Klaus Fuchs. He was a man of mystery and complexity. He was a German by birth, a, a, uh, a British by naturalization, and a communist by conviction. As a teenager in the 1920s, his passion was math. He was a young scholar who did not espouse political opinions. By 1933, he was a 21-year-old firebrand um, that the Nazi student leaders had come to hate and tried to kill. By 1945, he had aided three countries in developing the atomic bomb, the US, the UK, and Russia. So who was he really and what were his motives? Many accounts mythologize him as an isolated, reserved, lonely, frail individual. A characterization that has permeated and skewed our image of him. One aspect of the myth is valid. His basic nature was always reserved, but it isn't the divining characteristic. What defined Klaus Fuchs was his steely determination for social, political, and economic equality. He lived in a chaotic time. It's probably safe to say that if he'd lived in a different time, he would have been an esteemed professor of mathematics uh, at a renowned German university, a quiet, reserved scholar, and non-political. Instead, in 1950, he was sufficiently infamous that recently a friend asked me, was he really evil? How does one consider a person who risked his life to fight the Nazis, and then betrayed his adopted country. So perhaps the real question is, how do these factors weigh in the balance of moral accountability? Fuchs left behind very few personal letters. I was fortunate to find a number of untapped archives, and the ones that were most important to me were uh, about the University of Kiel in the little town of Schleswig, which holds very um, archives, and, and it was in these thick, dusty file folders labeled in German miscellaneous disciplinary matters. There were no connotations to Fuchs on anything to do with it until you opened it up, but they were crucial in revealing who he was as a Nazi resistor. The early days of his heroic risk-taking made him the man he was and are crucial to understanding his life and character. They stem from his family. So I'm going to start there. Klaus Fuchs was born on December 29th, 1911 in a little town named Rüsselsheim that is just south of Frankfurt. He was the third of four children whose early years were devastated by World War I and its aftermath. There was the Allied blockade and starvation that was horrible. Um, there was the Versailles Treaty and its owner's conditions. There was the Great Depression. There was, uh, and before that, there was the inflation. There was unemployment. It was not a good time to uh, be, be a child. And here he is with his brother on the right. He's standing in the army shirt, and they have little soldiers in trenches that they have dug down below during the war. Father Emil was a very liberal minister in a very conservative Lutheran church. Early on, he made the welfare of the working class his mission in life. He was a socialist, he was not a communist. He didn't believe in fighting and revolution. Um, from the pulpit and from articles and letters to the newspaper, he argued for the welfare of the working class and he condemned the right-wing militia that was growing up in Germany in 19, the 1920s. His views and personality greatly influenced his children, all of them, they all became socialists. Klaus was as reserved as Emil was outgoing. 
which was a lot. <laughs> um, but they had the same unbending steely core. As a teenager, though, Klaus was not involved in politics. He was the scholar in the family. He was famous for his mathematical gifts, you know, in, around the region. And as a senior at the gymnasium, he won the Weimar Republic's prize as the top student in the, in the whole area. And here is the family, the children with mother. They don't look like a very happy bunch at that time. The youngest one, Crystal, on the left looks like to me she's looking at her iPhone, but I'm not sure that's the case. In 1930, he registered at the University of Leipzig to study mathematics. Through the early 1930s, the Weimar government was unstable politically as it was unstable economically. President Hindenburg ruled by executive decree for the most part. The Parliament Reichstag was in a stalemate. There was no majority. They continued to have frequent elections to create a majority, and it always failed. But the elections did expose what was going on in the country and the divisions within the country. It would start with um, uh, mobs in the streets, and then you know it, it grew to being uh, shootings here and there, and then riots. And uh, at the end, there were stormtroopers who would rush in. The presidential election of 1932 was the key turning point in Klaus's life. The conservative president Hindenburg was running for his second term. The Socialist Party decided that it would um, support Hindenburg because it didn't want to, and not run its own candidate, because it didn't want to uh, divide the vote and allow another person to win, and that other person was Adolf Hitler. Klaus and his brother Gerhard, older brother, who had been at the University of Leipzig studying law when Klaus came at the beginning, um, had become an active member of the Student Socialist Party in Leipzig. And when there, Kla Klaus's first political act was to join the socialists. Soon he was fighting the Nazis in the streets, and he said later that he learned more in the streets than in the classroom that year. After the first year in Leipzig, he and Gerhardt moved to Kiel, and by this time in the um, late 1920s, the Nazis had connived to infiltrate and get a grip on German universities throughout the country. The, the Fuchses read, came, they registered for the, the Socialist Party, and they saw that the Nazi students had gotten, achieved this grip. It was very done very slowly and methodically, but it had happened. And so they decided to create their own party, a socialist party, to try to counter this influence. Gerhardt, who was as outspoken as his father and an activist, was the leader. Klaus, who was new to all of this, was the political organizer, was very much under the wing and influence of Gerhardt. So in 1932, not being able to support Hindenburg, they decided to support the communist candidate. Um, very quickly, the Socialist Party kicked him out. The Communist Party took them in, invited them in. They weren't sure what to do, especially Klaus took some time. He had some issues, but eventually they both joined and they never turned back. Previously, as I mentioned, there were previously overlooked university documents on Klaus and Gerhardt and their run-ins with the uh, Nazi students. His girlfriend and his father had similar stories in their memoirs, and it allowed me to render Klaus's struggles in the campus strife and his increasing hatred for the Nazis and them for him. Um, the Nazis actually uh, convened a secret council and sentenced him to, to death. All of that culminated in February of 1933, shortly after Hindenburg appointed Hitler as chancellor. And this act emboldened the Nazis um, when a riot, oh, I'm sorry, there's the socialist, um, the socialist gathering, you saw the, the, uh, the Nazis. Um, when, the, the, when a riot erupted in Kiel, stormtroopers rushed in. Um, they beat up Klaus and the other stu the Nazi students there yelled, throw him in the fjord. Now the fjord was a finger of the Baltic Sea. 
police stood by and watched. How folks survived the frigid waters of the Baltic Sea is a mystery. Only thing he ever said was he swam out. A few weeks later, by coincidence, he was on a train to Berlin for a conference and he read just hours before that the Reichstag had burned. He didn't know it beforehand. And when he arrived, he became of the underground network of resistors who were trying to be involved and stop the Nazis in another election that was about to occur. Reportedly, the lifespan of the Nazi resistor at that time, and these were all young people for the most part, was three months before the Gestapo grabbed them and tortured them. The Gestapo in Berlin was searching for Klaus. Those in Kiel had said, had alerted them and said he's the number one student on their list and they wanted him. So the, the Gestapo was working very hard. Klaus felt that they were closing in and in July of 1933, he fled to France. He was there for a few months and then he crossed the channel to and ended up at the University of Bristol. He was 21 years old. His university years in Britain gained, gained him a BA and PhD in physics. They didn't have a math concentration at that time. And later he earned an SCD at the um, University of Edinburgh where he became a postdoctoral student. Throughout, he discussed his communist opinions with students and friends and joined organizations. But secretly, he kept in touch with a group of other young communist refugees who were gathering in London. Folks' hatred of the Nazis grew as he learned about the destruction taking place in his family in Berlin. Gerhard, around 1936, had escaped to Prague, had contracted TB, and ended up in a san sanatorium and had a mental breakdown. His brother, I mean, his sister Elizabeth, in August of 1939, jumped off a train and killed herself. His mother had already killed herself some years before. Both mother and daughter had felt the threat of the Nazis, which had propelled them to get into that situation. Um, the only one remaining was Emil, uh, 67 years old, and he took care of this young child that was Elizabeth at that, you know, he was four years old. His name was also Klaus. So the father, the, Klaus's father, her father, um, protected little Klaus throughout the war. In September of 1939, World War II started. It was a phony war. The real fighting didn't start until May of 19. 40. And at that time, as France was rolled over by the Nazis, the German refugee community in Britain faced consequences. The British government worried that the refugees, who they knew were mostly Jewish, would be a fifth column and aid a German invasion. It ordered the refu many refugees to be interned. As one cabinet member said in a meeting, once a German, always a German. On May 12th, 1940, Klaus became one of the first um, refugees to be picked up among the about 30,000 who were interned. After internment, he shared little of his feelings about the eight months of confinement and, and the, 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 the squalor that he uh, faced. My evidence comes from interviews with, with three survivors, dozens of diaries, memoirs, and oral interview transcripts all at the um, Imperial War Museum. And I thank you all for that. Um, it shows that his time in capacity in captivity was characterized by isolation, starvation, and sadistic guards. He, like all the others, was rounded up into camps, surrounded by um, barbed wire and armed guards, no food, uh, little newspapers, a few newspapers, no mail, um, cram spaces, but there were Nazi uh, POWs. For him, the journey began from a makeshift jail in Edinburgh, and then he went to Heighton and then the Isle of Man. So Klaus Fuchs, as a refugee whose hope was to be able to defeat the Nazis doing something, ended up as one internee described it a caged animal. On July 2nd, 
1940, before departing on a ship for what became Canada, they didn't know it at the time, he wrote to his mentor, Max Born in, in Edinburgh. He said, I want to express in a few rushed words all I owe you during the time I have been with you. I find it hard to cut away from a country which I have learned to love, and until the last moment, I hope that, especially at such a time, it might not be necessary. But there's no point in deluding myself. And from that, there was a 10-day trip across the Atlantic to, to the Quebec City on the Ettrick. It was horrific. The internees on board lived through Nazi taunts, starvation, vomiting, and diarrhea with no access to a bathroom much of the time, with body fluids dripping from those in the hammocks above and buckets overflowing on the floors. Those relegated to sleeping on the floor uh, suffered the most. Wherever folks slept, and I don't know, he nor anybody else escaped the stench and the filth. I know, as um, Monica said, some you know people are interested in in the internment camps. So I want to read to you the beginning of a chapter on um, the the camps in Canada. The Saint Lawrence narrowed, and the scent of pine and spruce wafted across the ship's bow. Klaus Fuchs, along with the other thirteen emaciated young men packed together on the ship's deck, looked out on the verdant. Riverbank. After 10 days of living hell crossing the Atlantic, this seemed like a vision of heaven. One attorney estimated that given the bagginess of his clothes and the protrusion of his ribs, he had probably lost 10 pounds on the trip. Now, church bells pealed in the distance and the earth smelled sweet. On this sunny Saturday, July 13, 1940, roll call began on the upper deck at 10 o'clock and the sun's heat was welcome. As they came into the harbor at last, tugboats guided them past the bustling shoreline. At 1.30 p.m., the ship docked and reached its dock. Looming high above, majestic and bold, Klaus could see the Chateau Frontenac. They had reached their destination, Quebec. By 4 p.m., the man had stood for six hours in the sunshine that had gone from welcome to searing. After a long while, soldiers gave them their first drink of water, which was delicious, although lukewarm. Bathroom facilities eventually became accessible too, but internees doubled up with hunger pain received no solace. Simply, some simply lie down on the deck until the colonel ordered sentries to use bay bayonets if necessary to get them up. The officer viciously kicked a few to make his point. The Nazi POWs occupied another part of the deck and disembarked first. It was 7 p.m. before the refugees began to wind down the gangplank onto a pier lined with well-armed soldiers, bayonets at the ready. And the men walked past them and climbed onto buses where three guards made sure that these, quote, dangerous men, so beaten up that they could barely climb into their seats, caused no trouble. As motorcycle police escorted the buses up through the neighborhoods, terraced into the city heights, little boys derisively gave the Nazi salute. Women stood on corners, shaking their fists at them. Some spat and yelled. Much the same scene as when they had left Heighton. The buses reached the heights of the city and drove through the gates of the massive citadel onto the plains of Abraham, where in 1759, British forces defeated the French for control of Canada. At the top, an area known as Coe Fields, a camp nestled within doubled rows of barbed wire and sentry posts stretched out before them. Beyond that, in the distance, the unattainable and wild freedom of the St. Lawrence River. This was Camp L. Cliques formed in Camp L. The leader of the communists was the charismatic uh, Hans Kahler, who had been a friend in, a, in the Spanish Civil War of, of Hemingway's. He was a soldier. And Fuchs became his deputy and was able there to, um, there's Collar a second from the left. Um, he was able to talk to whomever he wanted and whenever he wanted about his communist views. There was nothing hidden about him anymore. The camp commander's choice for the internee liaison was the unlikely Count von Lingen, 
Um, that was an assumed name for Prince Frederick of Russia, the great grand, the grandson of Wilhelm II. This appointment did not sit well with the communists, and a rivalry ensued between Lingen and Kahler. But even with Lingen's designation, Kahler and Fuchs kept their hand in in the running of the camp. When the Canadian government decided to split up the camp um, to create a kosher one at the behest of the Orthodox Jews, it was Klaus who manipulated the numbers to put non-Jewish communists in that camp. Otherwise, their fate was a Nazi camp and they probably wouldn't have survived. It, they were hated even more than the Jews to some degree. And it, this move raised the enmity of the Orthodox Jews, which went on until Klaus finally left Camp End. Internment was a defining experience for everybody. While it alone it didn't create Klaus Fuchs the spy, it did reawaken Klaus Fuchs the communist and the resistor. The British government realized its error and started letting the, the internees out. Klaus returned back to Edinburgh in January of 1941. After a couple of months, Rudy Piles, a well known and respected German Jewish refugee, uh, invited him and physicist, uh, invited him to the University of Edinburgh, uh, offering him a job. He gave no description. He said it was top secret. Klaus didn't have security clearance, but um, Klaus accepted and he moved to Birmingham in May of 1941. Throughout these few months back, he had kept in contact with his communist friends from the camp and especially with um, Hans Kahler, who it turned out was a recruiter for the Russian military intelligence it is likely that Klaus didn't know that at the beginning. I'm sure he found out at some point. And in August 1941, Fuchs took the decisive step, I'm sorry, step into espionage that defined the rest of his life and sealed his fate. In his confession, Fuchs said that the internment um, was not pivotal in this decision. But 30 years later, he wrote to a friend when he was back in East Germany that had influenced him. In December of 1943, Fuchs sailed to, uh, to New York City with the British scientific team and he, uh, co to collaborate on the atomic bomb there. There he had a new Russian agent and they met fleetingly um, throughout the city. In July of 1944, he was transferred to Los Alamos to work with Rudy Piles, who was there uh, leading up some theoretical research. And he became responsible for the work on the lenses in the plutonium bomb, one particular piece of it. And by solving this problem of jets that was uh, compromising the chain reaction, he was key to the success of the bomb. On June 2nd, 1945, Fuchs stopped at the security gates. The guards checked his car. He got back in. He drove down to Santa Fe on the outskirts where he met his handler from New York and gave him the plans for the plutonium bomb. The whole time he was being checked in Los Alamos, the plans were in his pocket. A month later, uh, the US tested the plutonium bomb. It was a Trinity test at Alamogordo and then came Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When Stalin saw the, the devastation in Japan, he ordered an intensive program to build an atomic bomb. He realized the threat that the bomb posed to him. At the same time, the US and the UK scientists were arguing and pleading with the, their governments to have a sharing of information with the Soviet scientists. They knew there was going to be an arms race, and they thought the best way to not have one was to have the uh, Soviets have this information and then to impose on all sides a very strict inspection regimen. And the government, I mean, in a series of steps, it didn't happen, and basically the government and the military wouldn't go along. Upon his return to England in the summer of 1946, 
Hooks was appointed head of the theoretical research at the top secret nuclear facility at Harwell, which is near Oxford. Um, he worked on the commercial use of atomic power. At a separate site, the UK was building their own atomic bomb, and he was the main theoretical physicist who consulted with them. He, it wasn't his official job, but um, he gave them a lot of time and helped out. In between, he continued to spy. An event occurred in August that changed a 49 that changed Fuchs's life. The US and the UK um, were able to decipher some early 1940s messages between Moscow and New York, uh, for, between Russia, and um, they found evidence of a spy in the Manhattan Project. Clues very quickly led MI5 and the FBI to Fuchs. It was amazing, it was a few weeks. But without these messages, it was unlikely that Fuchs was ever going to be uncovered. With the discovery, a cat and mouse game between him and M MI5 uh, took place. It was not clear who was the cat and who was the mouse. It began with MI5 following his every move, phone call, and conversation. They needed to catch him handing off material so that they could arrest him. They couldn't use the messages that they had decoded and the evidence in it because in court because they didn't want the the Russians to know they had had this project. So they had to catch him. They followed him, but to no avail. He had stopped spying in April of 1949, a few months before. In the spring, this is amazing to me, months before um, the FBI and MI5 had any inkling of a spy, he somehow knew that there was going to be trouble. And, and he stopped spying. So when MI5 began tailing him, he picked up on it very quickly. How he knew about this potential discovery is a mystery, and we'll never know. Um, the only reference to it is in a letter to his father when he was in prison. So um, when the surveillance failed, uh, MI5, after much deliberation, decided to interview him. But after several interviews, he did not confess. Finally, at the end of January, a close friend uh, who had some idea that there was, uh, you know, Klaus had done something we shouldn't, it was given some information, didn't think it was very important. He convinced him that if Klaus didn't confess, his friends would be blamed and be under suspicion. So Klaus confessed, and that was the main reason why. Um, at, the, at, this, at the time that the U.S. and the British had begun looking for Klaus, there was a sober backdrop in that August. Um, the Russians had successfully tested, secretly, a plutonium bomb. Books' information had moved up their timetable by one to two years. The US and UK scientists never doubted that they would get a bomb. It wasn't giving them the bomb, it was just in, in advancing their schedule. Uh, they just didn't think it would be that quickly and everybody was stunned. MI5 didn't arrest Klaus uh, until February 2nd, 1950, about a week after he confessed. During the interviews, both the F MI5 agent and the director of Harwell, who was a kindly person and not given to deceit, had assured him that if he confessed, he could continue to do his research, maybe at Harwell, maybe at a university. So although Fuchs confessed because of his friends, the inducement he didn't believe, he believed the inducement and they didn't, he didn't feel like he needed to escape. They didn't arrest him. There was, he just continued with his life after he confessed. So on the second, he had an appointment in London um, to answer more questions about his spying. And once there, he was immediately arrested, which to him was totally unexpected and he was stunned. A month later, on March 1st, he was tried at the Old Bailey. Trial lasted 88 minutes. He pled guilty. 
the judge gave him the maximum, which was 14 years for espionage. Um, and off he went to prison. Earlier through the month of February, uh, the, the government had been very worried about this inducement issue. Uh, true to his own principles, though, um, that, that, he, that Klaus felt he had betrayed his friends and he deserved to be punished, and he accepted the punishment, even though at first he thought it was hanging. Um, he didn't challenge his confession with the inducement argument. His attorney, who had uh, collaborated with the prosecution, strongly supported this decision. So he was, he was really um, pushing Klaus to do this. But Klaus was shocked when he had a, the um, maximum sentence. He cooperated, he hadn't used the inducement, and he had expected a lighter sentence, but he didn't appeal it. He also continued to answer MI5's questions, which they had been a little concerned about, especially about the four Russian handlers he had had. He dragged out his descriptions of them and his recollections. And surprisingly, by the time he remembered, the person in question had left the country. Um, two people he didn't give up was his last handler in Britain and his American handler. He did give a vague description of the person in, um, in, in New York um, for the benefit of the FBI, who were under tremendous pressure from Hoover, their director, uh, to find this person because he looked terrible in the press. In May, two FBI agents arrived in London to further question Fuchs about this person. And Fuchs finally did identify him from a film clip. But two days earlier in Philadelphia, the FBI agents had arrested the man, Harry Gold. Folks somehow knew that Gold had confessed. Even so, FBI Director Hoover made sure that his agents in London took credit for ringing this ID out of Folks, um, where, of course, MI5 had failed. Hoover really pressed that. Four, there was a lot of um, competition between the two groups. For political reasons, at the end of 1950, the British government revoked Fuchs's naturalized citizenship. And he had pleaded with them not to do so, and he was devastated when they did. It wasn't to do with the sentencing, it was purely political. So he moved around um, to several prisons, the first being Wormwood Scrubs, and he was a model prisoner. According to the warden at Wakefield, he was, quote, held in high esteem by other men on the wing. In the last two years, he developed a curriculum teaching physics and math to the inmates, many of whom used it when they, were able, when they got out. It was an, a, a wonderful experience for them. And he was paroled in nine years because of good behavior. In yet another turnaround, the British government now wanted him to stay. He refused, maybe in part uh, because of losing his citizenship. Partly, his father was 85. He had spent very little time with him over the past 30 years. And Stalin was dead. If he had returned to Russia with Stalin alive, he would have been tortured and killed, there's no doubt. So on June 23rd of 1959, a policeman drove him to wake, from Wakefield to London Airport, which is now Heathrow, and he climbed aboard um, a Polish airliner. He arrived in East Berlin to no hero's welcome. Um, his nephew was there, Klaus, um, and uh, along with a, 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 you know, a government official, there were hordes of journalists as there had been in London. A limousine met them, drove them to um, Emil Fuchs's summer cottage, and uh, the driver, it started early, was a Stasi agent. He stayed for a few weeks with his father just to see him and to relax. And then he went to a health spa to try to recover from his nine months in prison. The government quickly appointed him to be the deputy director of the nuclear research facility in Dresden. And um, he had a nice apartment in the city and a weekend home nearby and the 
picture of him with his father and his nephew is in front of that um, weekend home. In September of 59, he, three months after coming home, he married Greta Kielsen, a woman he had met in Paris in 33, and the same government official who had met him at the airport in East Berlin. Washington's wanted him to move there to work on nuclear weapons when he got back. He refused. He planned to renew the research he had started in Harwell on um, nuclear power. And it turned out it was something that the East German government eventually would not support. And he was very upset about it. Later, he became he be started to call for um, nuclear disarmament. So the man who had been key in creating three bombs for the US, the UK, and the USSR became a peacenik, or it's possible he had already always been one. His father became a Quaker. Um, it's perhaps he held more highly the immediate goals of helping the US and the UK defeat the Nazis with, in case they needed a bomb. And at the same time, that made him have to work for Russia in order to protect Russia against capitalists and imperialists. Um, he maintained that his goal with spying was to create a balance of power and obviate the further use of bombs, which in a certain way fits in with the fundamental principle of maintaining peace. He died in January 1988 at age 76 from lung cancer. He was buried in a famous um, Berlin cemetery that was for noted communists. And he had a funeral procession with, you know, string quartet, um, choir. It was very lovely. The Russians had never admitted that he helped them. They had never recognized him. They wanted everyone to think that they had done it. And actually they could have, they just did it early. He, but on this occasion, they sent a very lovely wreath, their first recognition. And they also sent a representative, a young KGB agent from Dresden named Vladimir Putin. The significance of the military side of Fuchs's spying is unclear. The advance of one to two years for the Russians meant that they had a bomb when the Korean War started. There were many factors in Truman deciding not to drop a bomb. The Russians having one certainly played a part. Most people think that not dropping the bomb was a benefit. Um, the political downside from his actions is indisputable. Anglo-American nuclear cooperation faltered. The Russians learned that the US arsenal was small and they had a chance um, of parity. The Americans succumbed to the Red Scare whipped up by Joseph McCarthy. American civil liberties suffered and the Cold War heated up. Fuchs was a man molded by his roots and the shattered events of history. When his path as a serious mathematician crossed um, these the perils, um, he took life-threatening risks and grave choices. The question of moral accountability is difficult to resolve and consensus is highly unlikely. But in our current chaotic world, as in the Iron Curtain world, ambiguities prevail. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, Nancy. As I fully expected, that was totally fascinating and raises, I think, as many questions as it answers. Um, do you want to just stop um, screen yeah. sharing, and then we'll uh, I'll start looking at the questions that are coming coming in. Let's, let's start here, right? Um, okay, and the first one actually was picking up on what you said the British government had said. Just bear in mind that everyone, in other words, once a German, always a German. Uh, and uh, Marcia Wolfsreich here. Uh, what about the royal family? Well, that's I think probably beyond the remit <laughs> of this session, but of course, yes, that is an interesting uh, point. But they've changed their name. 
um, from Laura Robicek, that quote, once a German, or, or always a German, is so false. Yes, of course. Um, people change allegiances when they move, for example. The US is full of people who are originally German and other nationalities and are now American. Yes, indeed. As I say, I think this is probably a conversation for another right another right. day and uh, for those of you who obviously are very fascinated by the whole internment episode uh, Nancy and I are already in discussion about the possibility of her giving um, a talk focusing uh, more exclusively or indeed exclusively on the whole uh, uh, well Klaus's internment in in, uh, in England but particularly the whole Canadian um, internment experience which as I said at the beginning remains I think fully you know sort of still to be to be scrutinized carefully so hold you know hold fire on that if, if you would um, yeah. Um, Andrew Sorden, uh, yes, memoirs of Jewish internees I've seen do not refer to ill treatment on the Isle of Man, nor have I heard of such from the Italians. Mm. And then from Marcia again, being interned is by its nature a form of ill treatment. Well, clearly, how shall we go from here? I'm just um, <laughs> trying to think how to play this. I mean, clearly there's a lot of interest, as you know, this, this testifies in the whole internment experience. Um, I don't know. People, people we had did not have enough food on the Isle of Man. There was a tremendous shortage of food. Conditions, that, conditions got better. I think, I mean, if I can yeah, just inject yeah. there. He was um, there at the very beginning when it opened up. Yeah. It was chaotic, it was shambolic, it was inconsistent. Yeah. Uh, there were real hardships faced, not on the island, just the Isle of Man, but for example, Wharf Mills, some of the transit camps, the conditions were truly appalling. Mm -hmm. As time went by, the Isle of Man got much more civilised. But it remains right. true that when you look at the experience of those who were shipped off both to Canada and to Australia, without mm -hmm. getting into much detail, uh, you know, there is an awful lot that is totally shameful and utterly outrageous. And it does rather sound as though the Canadians don't have anything much to be proud of, at least in the beginning. But shall right. we perhaps just keep that aside for the moment? It's, it's a morally also, I and mean, it is a morally murky episode there's absolutely no question about it and I think you know particularly for British people and for people like myself and I suspect many of um, the people listening you know sort of to be the child of refugees who saw only good in England how wonderful England was taking them in etc when I first um, found out about the 1940 internment episode I was almost incredulous so I think you know anyway <laughs> there's a lot more to be said um, I think maybe we should just shift the focus somewhat and see what people have to say about the story specifically of folks which at times sounds like some crazy thriller doesn't it i mean really quite extraordinary um i've got yes um, a comment here from Jona Jekyll Kromholtz um i have a small addition on Fuchs's private life in england now i believe Jona, you've been in touch with nancy by email yes, so maybe would you like Jona to un unmute yourself unusually and and tell us um, what you have to add uh, can you hear me yes indeed go ahead well, I printed out just a very small um, section of a memoir that my mother wrote. Uh, my mother was an art historian who'd uh, been educated in England, though she was of Czech origin. Um, in Germany, I mean, although she was of Czech origin and came to London in 1934. Uh, she had gone to a, a secondary school in Berlin where she originally met someone who was to become Klaus Fuchs's lover. Um, she made contact with her again in the 30s, um, and uh, she writes about it. Um, I had always heard about this. It wasn't a secret in her family. Uh, my mother was called Edith Hoffmann, um, born in 1907, died in... Uh, 2016, <laughs> um, she said, I almost also um, renewed my acquaintance with a former schoolmate who had married an Englishman and was now living in Bristol. I did not know Erna very well, but when I wrote to her, she answered immediately and invited me to spend a weekend with her and her family. Erna was a small woman with curly brown hair and tiny hands and feet who had an irresistible power of attraction for certain men. She was also intelligent and had been a student of the philosopher Heidegger uh, in Heidelberg. She received me like an old friend, and our meeting became the beginning of a long-lasting friendship. Anna's husband, Herbert Skinner, um, a professor of physics at Bristol University and a um, very highly respected British person, I don't know how she met him, and I never understood the relationship. He was tall, good-looking, with beautiful eyes. Um, 
And they had a house, a large modernist house, as I see in some photographs I have and I've heard, which stood on a cliff at the edge of Bristol. And uh, they always had many guests. There were also some young men from Herbert's department at the university. And then she wrote on another occasion, um, their house is always full of young men. As Skinner liked to invite some of his assistants to stay with them. Anna was always the only woman and she always liked the company of these young men. It was obvious that they sometimes found their way into her bed. Um, at one time they were joined by a young man called Fuchs, who was of German origin. He was a very quiet person and Anna seemed quite in love with him. At one time, I told Anna that we were going away and our apartment was going to be empty so she could borrow it for a time while we were away. She stayed there with Fuchs for several weeks and they seemed to have enjoyed the time. When, I, when they left, I found that Fuchs had brought me a very elegant trolley. This is a tree tea trolley as a present. Then one day I discovered that Klaus Fuchs was a spy and had supplied the Russians with valuable information from Skinner's department. Well, and this is all you know, many of them moved around during the war. Um, his story was in all the newspapers, he was in prison. I did not see Emma at that time and I don't know how she took it. Um, I also remember Emma. Um, she was quite a character. Uh, Spinner died much before she did. Um, it's just interesting to see um, another little aspect, because nobody seems to mention much about his private life, uh, Fuchs's private life in London, England. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because, in a way, this reflects the very permissive um, sexual atmosphere in the Weimar uh, years in Germany, which I have noticed they were much more advanced in that respect than the British were at that time. <laughs> That's all I have to add. Well, when I was giving my story, I, I didn't name names because then I have to explain who the people are and I'd never finish. But it was Herbert Skinner who convinced Klaus to confess. Um, that was the close friend, uh, Erna's, hu Erna's husband. And I, in the book, I have detailed their relationship and between Klaus and Erna and between Klaus and Herbert and between Herbert and Erna. Uh, someone I got to know whom I interviewed, Lady Mary Flowers, um, was there as Mary Booneman at the time. And she wrote a memoir and I spoke to her and I read her memoir and she was good friends with Erna. So I got a, a, a very similar picture of Erna from Mary um, a, a, about the relationship with, with folks and, and Erna's having other lovers and looking the other way and all of those kinds of things. So it, it is uh, what I know completely backs up with what you have, Joanna. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I have a question here from Ian Wiblin, um, quite a specific one. Do you have further information about Greta Keilson and her communist past in Berlin? And how did she meet Fuchs in Paris? Um, I, again, for the sake of time, I've left out what happened in Paris. Fuchs went to Paris to be part of a student celebration, a, a peace conference. It, it, there had been an adult one, uh, and there was people, uh, this organization was somewhat of a communist front, but not completely. Um, the, his, his conference was in September, but because of the Gestapo, he had to get there early in July. And so when he got there, he helped Greta um, plan the conference. And the, in this city at that moment, all of the top communists were there, so who had, were in exile. Um, so he had an opportunity at that time to be heavily influenced as he was just starting out being a communist. He'd been a communist for a year. Uh, and really hadn't spent any time being a communist. He was really being a Nazi resistor. It was just a, a home for him uh, that he could spread out from. Um, so that's what he was doing in Paris. And so he knew her quite well. And I discovered that um, when he got to Bristol, he did, they did exchange some letters, uh, little cute little letters. She was married at the time. 
her husband had been implicated in the Reichstag fire and he'd finally gotten out uh, of prison at, at, during that summer. So for much of the time they were together, her husband was there too. Some people think they had an affair, I do not. Um, but they were friends, they did like each other. And she was a few years older than he also, but he also liked older women. Erna was older also. And then when his young nephew, little Klaus, who was, as you could see in the picture, quite grew up to be quite large, um, he brought a, he went to visit Klaus when Klaus was in prison and he brought a message from Greta because she was the government official in charge of giving little Klaus his papers to get out of East Germany. And um, it was something, and, and in Paris, she was called Margot. They, and so he, he gave Klaus regards from Margot and Klaus knew who that was. And so they had had sporadic little um, connections during the years. And her husband had died by the time he was in East Germany. There are people who have written that they were married just for the purpose of the East government being able to keep track of him. I don't think so. They had a very, uh, I became friends with co the cousins and one of them was a student there. And I, you know, they, she would go and visit them. Um, and she's an American, but she went, she went to, she was Crystal, uh, folks' daughter, the youngest. And um, she found that they had a lovely relationship. And I, I don't believe it was just, um, you know, because the German government might have, you know, encouraged it, but they cared about each other and they took care of each other for the years they were together. So uh, another question from Marcia, um, how does the speaker define the differences between socialism and communism? Uh, she mentioned, you mentioned Nancy, that Emil Fuchs, the father, was a socialist, but not a communist because he didn't believe in the violence. Right, and I, in my own simple way, as define it that way, that socialism, as you see in Sweden, and um, what the Weimar was try trying to do, but couldn't because they were the social democrats were very strong in the Weimar. Um, we're trying to get to a sense of equality through the democratic process. Communism, communism did not believe that was possible, that the capitalists and the imperialists had such a grip on the world that the only way to do it was through revolution. So I, and then they were espousing similar. Um, principles of equality. And there were many other differences, but I see that as the main one and the one that in the Fuchs family made a difference because um, Emil didn't, he ended up in East Germany, but he did not go, he, when he got there, the quote revolution was all taken care of by the war. So uh, he never became any part of the Communist Party um, when his sons did. And they decided they weren't going to listen to their father about um, pacifism at that point. They decided the only way they could, well, partly defeat Hitler, that was partly what they were doing with the communists, was to become a communist, and they just did it. So that's how I, I mean, it's a very simple uh, distinction, but it tended to be the main one in the um, Fuchs family. So that's my distinction. Thank you. Another uh, nice small question, <laughs> like the previous one, uh, from somebody called Jim by Jovi, which I suspect is not his actual name. Um, anyway, yes, a question for Nancy on the subject of was Klaus Fuchs really evil? Big question mark. From what I gather, the espionage activity was in effect a case of following the dictates of one's conscience. It raises an interesting question as to the rather emotive term evil. Can someone acting under the drive of conscience be said to be evil or at worst simply misguided? subjectively speaking. I agree with that. Um, I don't think of him as evil. And uh, I, it, he was following his conscience 100%. And if you, if you read the book, you will see that what he did, he felt was completely consistent throughout. Yes, he did portray um, Britain, but he also saw that when he was giving secrets to the Russians, the Russians were allies and the British had promised to 
to share information with them, which they had not been doing. So he just kind of helped them out because they weren't fulfilling their part of the bargain. I, you know, so he could rationalize a lot of things and, and he did follow his conscience. That, that's all um, completely true. Perhaps I can pick up on that, Nancy. You seem quite emphatic, both in your talk today and in the book itself, that his reason for confessing was essentially out of a sense of, of duty or, or loyalty to his essentially British friends. Right. Is that, can that be the whole story? Because he'd already stopped spying. And I do think you, did, you touched on the question of his possible disillusionment with the Soviet regime. I mean, surely that must yes. have played a part. Yes, but he could have been disillusioned and not wanted to go to jail to, to prove it. I mean, he, he didn't, so he knew he, well, he didn't know if he'd be punished or not. Um, he was told he probably wouldn't be punished, but it wasn't so much his British friends. Many of his friends were German refugees and they would have been the most under attack. They, if the MI5 didn't get a confession, they would have to look elsewhere, and that's where they would have looked. So, and he'd become very close to some of those people, both to Rudy Piles and Max Born and other people. Um, there were an awful lot of um, German Jewish, for the most part, refugees who were physicists. So, um, I don't know if it was. I thought. I mean, many people say he was induced and how could he have been so stupid to believe MI5? I don't think that was the inducement to, that got him to confess. It, it, and he, didn't, he, did, he did want to stay. At that time, he wanted to stay and settle down in England. Um, there was no doubt. He was talking about it. So uh, I, I agree with you. There must have been. But what it might have been, I do not know. I mean, that's all was said to me. It was what he said, it's what his family said. And it certainly, the encounter with Herbert Skinner did take place and right after he had that encounter, he did confess. I have quite a few other questions, but I, I want to give priority to, to others listening in from somebody called Anne. Uh, was it possible for Nancy to have a look into the Klaus's Stasi file or is it still secret or vanished? No, I spent a few days at the uh, Stasi Library archives and um, many things were blacked out or there were, there were pages that weren't there, but I got hundreds of pages. And I, I, I'm not so sure, I mean, I did get a sense of his life because there were informants all over the place, you know, the cleaning ladies, his driver in the cab, everybody reported back. So, but he didn't, as he lived in England in the U.S., he didn't do much. You know, he worked. He was a nice person, basically. They didn't have much to report about him. He didn't talk a lot. So um, I think, that, you know, what was there, more of what was there in part was the government not letting him do what he wanted to do. There was some of that in, you know, just the normal correspondence. Some of that was also in, the, in their archives, um, government archives. And some of it, I have some KGB files and, uh, you know, the disappointments that he suffered over his not being able to do his research. I just, it's something I didn't put in, but it, I think it's important. At close to the um, end of his life, he gave an interview and he was talking about his research and he made just a couple of sentences about how he didn't realize when he came to East Germany that the research that he was doing in England that was you know, non-weapons work and had to do with reactors and, you know, and electric uh, uh, power, nuclear power, was not going to be seen in, in favor by the, the East Germans. And when, the way he said it made me think, did he regret coming back because it did keep him from doing what was his, it was from a, a professional point of view, what he loved. And he, his profession and his mathematics and his physics was very, very important to him. So he ended up not really doing anything very important in, in, from a research point of view. Um, but there seemed to be at least a wistfulness and in, in what could have been if he had gone back to the Brits because they, probably would have let him do the research.
Uh, one never, he never said anything more than that. So one never knows. He never talked to his relatives or anything about it. He just didn't complain and he didn't tell people much. Are there any other comments or, or questions? Uh, it's probably time to begin rounding things up or closing up. Um, so please do uh, come forward if you, if you wish to. I have two questions, one quite specific and one picking up on what you've in fact, said several times, uh, which I'll keep to the last. And the first question is to do with his relationships and interactions with other spies, people spying for the Soviets in this country, which I think will interest the assembled company, particularly Jürgen Kuczynski and Edith Tudor Hart and the whole Isocon flat milieu, which you may need to say a little bit about. But how much evidence mm -hmm. is there of those interactions and how, how significant are they? He and Jürgen had known each other in the underground in Berlin, and his Jürgen's sister, Ursula, Sonia, um, was one of his handlers. So he and Jürgen were close. Uh, they saw each other while they were in England. They were not close when they got back to, when he got back to East Germany, they weren't particularly close friends. But in, in England, they had, uh, maybe because Klaus had confessed or something. But, so he knew Jürgen, he knew the, Kaczynski family, I think. As far as I know, he didn't know anybody else. There's the uh, Hempstead um, cultural German, oh, I, it's too many words, German cultural society that was created and they would have parties and meetings and things. And, and he did go to those and there were many people that he knew from the old days in Germany. Um, so who he might have seen there, I mean, it wouldn't have been Edith Tudor Hart, she wouldn't have been there, but other people who were German refugees who might have done some spying or been involved uh, would have been there. Jürgen and his sisters would have I, th been. I think you're thinking of the Free German League of Culture, as it was That's called it. in English. That's it. Yes, <laughs> I always said very close to, to, to the Isokon building, which is just yeah, yeah. So, so, so as far as I know, he you, the Kaczynski's he'd have to have relation, you know, relationships with. But I don't think of anybody else. Certainly none of the British spies was he involved with at all. And he was involved with nobody in the US except his handler. So he he was very self-contained. He was friends with some people, but Jürgen was the only one outside his handlers that I know that he had, and Hans Koller were the only ones that um, he had any association with. I don't want to digress too much, but I think the Free German League of Culture is actually a very interesting phenomenon and more work has been done recently on it, yes. but it came to be yes. increasingly dominated by the communists and many of them went back to East Germany in due course. Yes. But equally, there's quite a lot of resentment on the part of those who have perhaps been social democrats in Germany mm -hmm. who blame yes. the communists for indeed splitting the vote, the anti-fascist vote, which is a whole big subject in itself. Yes. So the kind of power jostling for power and the kind of resentments and tensions between the two political groups in this country is also very interesting topic yes much more to be said uh, no more questions i'm surprised i have to say i do urge you the book is a, a fascinating read i think you've seen that nancy talks very fluidly but the book also is is, is you know it, it does read sometimes almost like a thriller so i highly recommend it perhaps i can just finish with one last question nancy and that is mm -hmm. something i think i know what the answer is going to be but you know as a biographer obviously over a period of time and you've told me that you worked on the book for quite a few years, but with any biography, you know, you become immersed, don't you? Almost yes. submerged in you the really do. of your subject. Do you feel, however, at the end of the day that you fully understand who he was? What kind of man he was, what made him act in the way that he did? That is a very good question. And I don't think I do. I think I probably understand him better than anybody else who has written about him. I think I understand him as well as maybe his relatives do. But I think inside, he was a nice person. He had this, these strong convictions. He followed them. I can't believe, it, it seems like he just made simple decisions and that were his, you know, they, they weren't complicated for him. I can't believe that that's not the case and that he didn't have more concern um, in any, at any point, and he never seemed to evince any of that, but I, I think he was even more complex than is um, realized. And I think he had maybe more anger or hatred or whatever than he showed, you know, towards the British being in prison. I can't believe that he'd just be um, 
and take that and just say, okay. I mean, but that's what he, he looked like he did. He adapted to whatever situation was in front of him. If it wasn't one he liked, whether it was the camps or prison or East Germany or wherever, he just adapted and made the best of it. So you don't know what was really going on as he did that. And you don't, I cannot imagine that something wasn't going on in his head. Yes, that's the sense I had of a kind of core of unknowability, even yeah. at the end of many years of research. Yeah, yeah. Good, well, that's, I think, perhaps an appropriate point at which to end. Thank you very much indeed, Nancy, and thank everybody for uh, attending this evening. Um, for those of you who clearly are intrigued by the whole complex internment episode, I would urge you to take a look at the Insiders Outsiders website, which actually will give you access in the news section to recordings of several events that have happened both last week and also during Refugee Week, that's to say in June, which relate to internment um, so and there will be more to come almost certainly in the autumn so I will say goodbye now actually yes here's a message from Anne thank you very much for this session thank you Nancy and good thank day. you very much goodbye everybody, everybody.